If you enjoy watching Common Ground online, please consider making a tax-deductible donation at lptv.org. Lakeland Public Television presents Common Ground, brought to you by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Welcome to Common Ground. I'm your host, Scott Knudsen. In the season eight finale, join Grant Goltz of Birchbark Canoe as he shares his experimental archaeology theory on black duck pottery with a group of First Nations women from Winnipeg. I've been studying pottery for probably since around 1980. Here they come. Christy, my partner over there, her main course of study when she was in the university was centered on ceramics too, so she has been studying them a long time. But there was a lot of misconceptions as to how this pottery was made. The problem was no one ever actually tried to do it. Right. Looked at the surface and, oh, it looks like it's got cord marks on it, and so that must be what it is, you know. And, and when I started looking at it a little bit more and and, and then we would take impressions from the pot and then you look at those and then you see what actually made the impressions on the surface. I said, that doesn't look like a cord, you know. I said, just wrap a cord around a paddle and pound on the pot and that makes this. And I said, well, but look, I said, there's these little strands that go from, from one row to the next here. Every once in a while you can see those and that wouldn't happen. And, and if they kept pounding it, it wouldn't be clear. It would be superimposed stuff going there which way. And, I, and it's all nice and neat and clear, and I said, I think it's something else. And Lee Sims was on to that too, and so we started talking, and then we started figuring it out, and he talked about this one kind of weaving that nowadays it's been done in Scandinavia, pretty much, but it probably was all over the world, and he said, oh yeah, there's examples from Peru and all over, and it's, a, it's not a weaving like cloth, you know, it goes like this. It's a weaving where all the fibers go in the same way and they're just twisted together. Oh. And uh, he said, I think that's what it is. And I said, that would make sense. So a lot of the archaeologists just laughed at me, you know. They said, ah, oh, you don't know what you're doing. And I said, well, you have never looked. At least I'm looking. Yeah. And uh, I did some weaving. This is the first thing I wove. Now this is made from natural fibers. It's made from fibers of the wood nettle, which is a native plant. It's not the stinging nettle because that was brought over from Europe. That's not, it's an introduced species, but there's always been the wood nettle, which is a native species. And the outside of the stem has fibers in it. And you can peel that off, you soak the stems in water, and then you can process these fibers. And that's what I made this out of. And so here's my first example of that weave. Oh, you yeah. see how it's twisted? It's twisted with two strands right there, twisted together. And then one strand gets connected to a strand from the next twisted, and then they become a strand, and the other one from it goes over here. So they interlink back and forth. That's what holds it together. And these sections of twist can be any length. They could be one twist or 20, you know. And when you stretch that out, it looks like rows of string. Yeah. See, and that's where people are getting the string. But if yeah. you look, there's little things go across every now and then. So you hook them, hook them together and the string kind of offset now and then. And the so, problem with the string on the paddle is that when you're paddling, it's really hard to keep it in a straight line. Yeah, and like also it gets plugged up with clay after a while. Yeah, too. that's right. And, you, and pretty soon you're not making clean lines, anymore. lines anymore. And you're gonna get crisscrossing as well if yeah. you're doing it. And sometimes you do, but you can get crisscrossing in the weave too. Okay. See, when you get this bag down at the bottom, when it's got to go from this big around to nothing, mm -hmm. then you got to start doing some things like this. So you can get crisscrossing, but it's still in the weave. Yeah. It's not in this. Right. And that's frequently when you see a whole pot, one of the things sometimes you'll see is in the upper part it'll have straight rows, and when you get past the, the widest part of the pot, 
then sometimes they start going going together like this and that's because of the, what you have to do to make that weave but anyhow this is what I did and I made a whole bunch of pots in this thing see and what happens you can put this around the pot it'll stretch with the pot so as you make the pot bigger this can stretch out what this does see one of the things working with the, the natural clays it's not like it's not like commercial ceramic clay you can't handle it that way it it doesn't stay together as well because what you can't have a real high clay content you have to have something else mixed with it uh, crust stone or sand or something or else you can't fire the pots because they'll explode because they're not porous enough to let this moisture out that's still in there well when you get the clay mixed down to that point it's hard to make a big pot stay together and when you look at some of these broken ceramics I've seen them where they're only this thick Wow! and a pot this big around no you can't do that it just you can't no you can't you it collapses can't do on it. itself because, it will yeah because it can't hold itself up because the structure just it's it's not strong enough right and see what this does holds it together that totally makes sense and uh, as opposed to the paddling because like we were talking before the paddling makes it collapse in inward into yeah. itself and then you get rippling on the inside yeah I'm gonna take a photo of that that's just a little my some of my ramblings on this pottery before we really get into the hands-on doing stuff well we're, we're going to be using natural clays this particular clay just came from just a little ways down the road we're going to be going over there here we are out here in the scramble pit and there's a cut bank so we can see how the clay that we're going to use for pottery how it occurs if you look right up on that bank you'll see a gray kind of grayish tan surface layer with a darker brown layer underneath that and then it's just the yellowish brown underneath that the lighter stuff what has happened is that light gray surface everything used to look like what's below the lighter yellowish brown all the way to the top but over time the clay particles have been washed out of that surface, that gray layer, and they've accumulated in that brown layer. So the brown layer has been enriched with clay-sized particles to the point that it is just about ideal for what we need for making pottery. Okay, let's walk up there. We may find something before we get that far. But I was going to say. If we do, we'll stop. I mean, if you're middle of a sand area, you won't get any. But if it's kind of more the mixed glacial deposits, look around you'll be able to find something like this and it's easiest where there's exposure like something like this see here's good stuff too it was right Ooh. here exposed at the surface and you see how it's cracking up when it dries mm -hmm. that's a clue that, that that we're in that clay because it shrinks when it dries that's right and see how it sticks to the shovel <laughs> see we dig we dig into this it's pretty hard See how brown that is? And see right on here, what makes this dark brown is those clay particles are coating all the blocks of soil. All so, right. Okay, let's head our way down. You want me to carry that? Nope, we're I'll still good. With you. you can take this. Actually, if you want to just put it on this road, I'll drive the truck up here and we can load it right here. Okay. Okay, this clay, came from the same place where we were this morning except it's been sitting in his bucket for years and it's all dried out so what we're going to do is we're going to pulverize this clay up and I'm just got a cement block thing here that I'm working on now we can just break it up in pieces and then we can kind of grind it down if there's any stones in it we'll just smash the stones Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna quick try to get this done so we got something to work with. And I feel like we need a second one so we can do it too, beside uh -oh. you. There's another brick over there. <laughs> Woohoo! Um, I can move over, just need another rock. Yeah, we'll ignore this part. Yeah, that'll work good for the grinding. You've got a big flat surface there. Yeah, I imagine my task is a little bit easier than yours with it smooth. Shake, 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 shake. Yeah! Good 
job. Okay, now we'll dump this right here. Good girl. Excellent job. Okay, we'll add some water and we'll just start to get a little bit of it together here so we So already wet clay is harder to hydrate. It is, because yeah. the water won't go into it. Yeah. But when you have something that's completely bone dry, the yep. water is More easily right able to in, move yep. around within the material. Actually, funny enough, it smells like my childhood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just take it and just smash it down onto some of that and it'll stick right on. Okay. There you go. And then you can just, then you can just keep turning it. And I've learned, I, I mean, I learned how to wedge mm -hmm. this way too. Gets out the air bubbles. Because you don't want... Air, bub air bubbles don't hurt anything in these. Really? Yeah. Oh, because of the so high sand content? And because of the porosity of the thing. I mean, air, moisture, anything can go right out. Really? And uh, it's probably there. Time we make this into coils and rolled it out, it'll all get equalized. Okay, I'll get a bunch of these out, they all work. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna coil up kind of a pot that's almost like one of those cone-shaped pots in a way, but the bottom won't be quite that pointed, but we'll be making it upside down. So with the, the mouth of the pot will be on here and the bottom will be end up up here. But see, I just start out like so, it's, I don't spend a lot of time on this. get started and then I'll right away make another one and that goes on top of here. Now what I'm going to do you know I just with my thumb and kind of smearing it on and at the same time kind of flattening it because mm -hmm. see then it stretches and gets longer and it'll make it all the way around. And it looks kind of crude now but now we'll start cleaning it up. You got to have a little something to work with before you really do much to it. So and I kind of not let it get too wild full of cracks and stuff, but it'll have some. And then I take one of these shells and, and see it. And when you scrape this way, it smooths it. Later on, we'll be scraping this way if we want to thin the inside down because it'll shave off layers. But for now, we use it this way. See, we can just, and it'll, the clay will kind of stick on it at first because it's, because just like I said, that clay is like this and it comes apart. As that clay starts flattening down, it'll smooth off and it won't stick on here anymore. So we'll just work this around and see we're kind of making it a little smoother on the inside. And this, all, this is also evening out the thickness a little bit. But we want this right now, we want this thicker than the finished pot's going to be because we'll be thinning it down later because it will stretch this pot out. Okay, now... I'm going to take this, kind of, kind of smooth this outside a little bit. I don't want it too lumpy because before I put that bag on, I want a fairly even surface because this makes it easier. See, if you want to feel how just how thick I'm doing it, that's probably you want to do that. Yeah. Okay. You get some idea what because that's what you're going to have. Wow, that's going to become really thin. Oh, it's going to be like this when we get the pot done. Oof, that's insane. But that's what it goes they were. against everything I've learned well, so far. You weren't in that big pot that I got sitting up there. Go lift that big one, I, and you see how lightweight that is yeah, because because it's thin. It's not quite that thin, but for its size, it's thin. I've seen broken pots that were the size of that, actually bigger and rounder on the bottom, that were only this thick. They weren't even three millimeters thick. Wow. The whole bottom. That's crazy. Like an eggshell. That's crazy. Cool, hey? Okay, now this should be enough clay to finish it. Sweet. Finish the bottom. And see, I'm, and I'm taking a little more time as I go to, to bond it up good because I'm not going to be able to reach inside for a while. Okay, I'd like to have this a little smoother, but I, I don't have my hand inside so I can't push it out. I can't lift it up and do it because then it will fall apart. But I'll get every close. I'll know that I got to straighten that out when I put it in the bag. 
Now I'm gonna set this up. It is, that's a gorgeous object, hey? Yeah. Let's just moisten this up a little bit so it's more flexible. And then what I've done, we're gonna wring out some of the water out of this. Yeah, I get all over myself. I'm trying to make a fashion statement here. Oh, yes. <laughs> that's good. Okay, so now we got this woven fabric bag. There's kind of an inside and an outside to this, but I'm not sure. Yeah, because yeah, see, because this shows this a little bit more. It pops out. And the other side doesn't. It's more straighter. Right. That's the side that goes next to the pot. Okay, now we'll put this over that pot. Now this is big enough. We could make a much bigger pot in this, but see what happens is I'll stretch it down and it'll get these ridges will come out of it because it stretches it, make it into a longer, skinnier fabric bag. Okay, now what we're going to do, I'm going to pick this up. It's small enough I can do it. I'm going to set right side up in here, okay? And we'll make sure we got this kind of squashed into it. We've got a little extra here. So now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start out in the bottom because I want to get that bottom fused together a little bit better. Let's see, I can turn this around now. I can handle it. And see, so now see inside, see how that bottom's getting rounded already? Yep. Okay, Take a look. I'll work my, I'll gradually work out from the middle. Yeah. And I'll work my way up the sides. So your hand's at the bottom supporting it, so... Yeah, my hand's outside of the, of that. Now see, my hand's up against right, it when, down I'm, there. when I'm working it. Right, so you're still cradling it even though it's got that hoop and the yeah, hide. Yeah, right. as I work my way up, this bag will stick on it a little bit yeah. more. And you're always pushing it back onto the bag, right? Yeah, now when I get up here higher, then I can do it more directly. And you're using like aggressive or firm movements? I'm intentionally trying to push it enough so it stretches the pot. Okay. Yeah. So you need a little bit of firmness because I yeah, know some do. people some people are afraid that they're gonna break things and so yeah, they just kind of see, like See, that's why you got the bag it. on the outside. Because that should hold it together. Now it sometimes it does get a few little cracks that you gotta put back together, but yeah. That's not a serious thing. See, you can see what the shape is starting yeah. to do. See how wide it's getting now? Yeah. Like it was like this. Yeah. And now it's like this. It's yeah, so beautiful. It's, and see, we're getting this surface texture in it yeah. a little bit. I don't see that. It's oh, coming yeah. in. Cool. It's not, not really a lot. We'll get more of that in it as we get this thing a little stretched out. So at this point, there's, you know, a number of cracks. Like there's one right yeah. here. Yeah. And, we, and that's what we'll look for those and, and just smear a little clay in there and work work them out and, and there's all there's always going to be some things like that because it's really wet right now yeah but, but it isn't bad sometimes i have worse than that oh really okay oh yeah, yeah see now we're going to see that's a kind of texture we're yeah be working for <laughs> so cool <laughs> i think i'm going to try to raise the shoulder up just a little bit bring this up a little bit we don't need that much rim okay on this size of a pot, but I want to get it get it even all the way around oh, first. That's a big crack now. Pardon? It's a big crack now. It's right through. Yep, there it is, isn't it? That'll be okay. It'll work. What I'm going to do is I'm going to finish off this rim of this vessel and put the decorations on. Right now I'm just kind of evening up some of the high spots leveling it down. It's not bad to start with, so it's not going to take me too much to do this. Now, this type of pottery was most commonly decorated with what we call cord-wrapped objects or cord-wrapped sticks. So we end up with this tool that has rows and rows of cords. And what's, what's how this is used by pressing it into the damp clay to leave an impression. What they did is put rows, some rows of horizontally applied lines. In other words, what I'm going to do, tilt this up a little bit, and then I'm going to apply this tool, pushing it into the clay, and see how it's making that row of decoration. 
Then I'm going to move down a little bit and do it again. So we've got two rows and we'll just continue until we get all the way around the pot. We can do this in stages. We'll make these horizontal lines. Then we're going to make some slanted, not quite vertical marks above them. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take this and use just a short end of this and we're going to put some designs. We support it on the inside with our finger. There, now we got that. Now usually there's, there's a decoration on the top of the rim and sometimes there's a decoration on the inside. What's common on the inside when there is something is another slanted row of these these marks although they're generally longer and they're not done very deep and they're usually kind of more widely spaced and so they just kind of look like that. Now on this particular style of pottery a lot of times what you see is the very edge of the lip looks wider and that happens when you do this. You don't push this straight down you tilt it a little bit and you don't go level you have a, a little outward bevel to it. Yeah, yeah, and see what it's doing? It's widening this. Yeah. And it's kind of distorting the top edges of these things mm -hmm. a little bit. And it's also kind of squashes some of the cracks full at the very lip. There, there's that part done. We're almost around on this. And then we'll make a little row of what we call punctates after this, and that'll be the entire sum total of the decoration. This will be put between those two rows of horizontal decorations and we'll just push it straight in. Now what this does, it makes a little dents in the outside and as we get this around you'll be able to see what it does on the inside. It makes little bumps on the inside. Okay, I'm gonna get some stuff to start a fire. Here's the pot we're going to fire. It's been drying for about a week. So it should be have most of the moisture gone. But before, just to make doubly sure, we'll set it here and let it, let it warm up a little bit as we're getting the fire going. And see, we don't use bigger wood to fire the pot because we want to get it, the fire to burn up real quick. And we, and we don't need the fire to last a long time. Okay, we're gonna fire this pot. You wanna come on up and join into the process come on, Laura. here? Okay, we've let this pot heat up now, so there shouldn't be any moisture in it, so we shouldn't have any problems with it disintegrating from steam letting out. So I'm rearranging these bottom logs here, and we're gonna set the pot on those in the fire, and there's a little space so air can get in. So now we're gonna start stacking wood around the pot. I'm going to take a little, a few pieces of this and get them going and get to get some of the flame spread around, make sure this wood's going to stop burning. Can some of you grab a little bit of birch bark? Yeah, there's a lot of humidity today and it's kind of got this wood. Wood is not, it's not willing taken to off like it's supposed to. Yeah. It's getting started a little bit now. I might get just a little scrap a birch bark and use it to kind of ah, it's starting on that side now. Yeah that's what we want to get going. We can get a big roaring blaze here. Yeah the fire is going good now. As soon as that fire burns down so the wood falls kind of away from the pot it'll be all done fired. We should start seeing some orange glowing in between, if we, especially if we look down in the bottom. It should be getting about that hot. It's kind of hard to see in there. See, and if the pot was gonna break and pieces blow off, we would've, it would've done it by now. Right. So we didn't hear a popcorn popper sound, we know we're good to go. It is kind Thanks. of a dull glow at the, yeah. in the bottom down there a little bit. Yeah, it's almost done. If the fire would fall away now, it would be fired well enough. Yeah. Sometimes when I've got a big pot, 
and the wood falls off the top uh, fairly soon. When it gets about like this, I'll reach in with a stick and turn the pot the other way around so it's right side up so the bottom gets more in the heat. But for all practical purposes, it's, it's done. We can kind of knock the fire down a little bit. Oh, it's tinging. Nice. Isn't that sound? Mm -hmm. It's, it's That's good. That's what we want. It's good. And see now what we could do, we could have like three rocks in there and we could lift that pot on there and we could start cooking in it right now. Really? <laughs> yep. Yeah, there it is, a fired pot. Thanks so much for watching. Join us again next season on Common Ground. If you have an idea for a Common Ground piece that pertains to North Central Minnesota, email us at legacy at lptv.org or call us at 218-333-3014. To view any episode of Common Ground online, visit us at lptv.org. episodes or segments of Common Ground, call 218-333-3020. Common Ground is brought to you by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the Vote of the People, November 4th, 2008. If you enjoyed this episode of Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground, consider making a contribution at lptv.org.